There are two different forms of stroke. Ischemic stroke, which accounts for more than 80% of the cases of strokes, and then hemorrhagic stroke, which accounts for less than 20% of the cases of strokes. So in a separate video, I have discussed the hemorrhagic stroke as well as hematoma. So here I'm going to focus on ischemic stroke as well as mini stroke, also known as transient ischemic attack. So first, starting with TIA. TIA is a transient neurologic dysfunction that lasts less than 24 hours and it's due to the temporary blockage in the vessels that are supplying the brain. So it's caused by ischemia without acute infarction. Now there are three different forms of TIA. With the atherosclerotic TIA, it's usually caused by the occlusion of the internal carotid artery. So internal carotid artery and if it's more than 70 percent occlusion then there is an increased risk of TIA and these patients usually present with for instance arm leg and tongue numbness as well as eyelid drooping but then the symptoms only last for minutes and so by the time they arrive to the emergency departments the symptoms are usually resolved but then TIAs must be taken seriously because they indicate that the patient is very likely to develop stroke in the future. So that's why it's recommended to start lifestyle modifications and if there are no contraindications, place the patient on aspirin. In any case, back to the discussion, the second form of the TIA is embolic TIA. And so embolic stroke generally happens when a piece breaks off and lodges into a distal artery. So embolic uh, TIA is usually lasting for hours until the body dissolves the clot and so it allows the brain to be reperfused. Lacunar stroke is usually from the occlusion of the vessels that are, that are arising from middle cerebral artery as well as circle of Willis. And this condition is usually caused by hypertension. Now moving on to stroke, there are four different forms of the ischemic stroke. It could be thrombotic, which is most commonly caused by the atherosclerotic lesions, which causes decreased perfusion of the brain as a consequence of which there would be a pale infarct because of decreased blood perfusion. On the other hand, there could be embolic strokes where a piece breaks off and um, lodges into a distal artery and causes blockage. But then by the time the emboli resolves and the body um, digests it, what happens is that blood will reperfuse and thus it would cause hemorrhage. So this type of ischemic stroke is presenting with a red infarct. And generally risk factors to embolic strokes include, for instance, atrial, fibrillation, which increases the risk of clot formation, DVTs along with a patent foramen ovale. So what happens is that if there is DVT, it usually goes to the lungs because DVT first goes to the right side of the heart and then from there it will go to the lung. But then if there is a patent foramen ovale, then it could go from the right side of the uh, heart to the left side and from there on go to the brain and cause an ischemic stroke. And then uh, endocarditis. And then finally, carotid dissection are the other risk factors to embolic stroke. Now, most of these emboli are usually lodging in the middle cerebral artery. And the reason for that is that 80% of the blood that is carried by the large neck arteries will flow into the middle cerebral artery. And so therefore, it's very likely that one of the branches of the middle cerebral artery will be affected by the embolic stroke. Next, we have the systemic hypoperfusion, which can cause from hypotension, from, for instance, cardiac malfunction, pulmonary embolism, or bleeding, and this condition will affect the areas that are um, least perfused in the brain, including the watershed areas as well as deep cortical layers. And one of the uh, presentations of the systemic hypoperfusion is visual disturbances. And so here I have a question for you. What does watershed area mean? So watershed area is a region that is being supplied by two major arteries. And so since it's a border zone between two different arteries, the perfusion in these areas is not really good. And so once you have problem with the blood supply, so if there is systemic hypoperfusion, then the watershed areas are the first to be affected. 
The next form of the uh, ischemic stroke is uh, caused by hypertension. And so hypertension is causing hyaline arteriosclerosis of the vessels. As a consequence of which, there would be thickening of the blood vessels. There won't be enough blood supply to the brain. And so it will cause lacunar infarct. So normally enough blood flows go there. Now that there is arteriosclerosis, there is less blood that will flow through. And so there would be a lacunar infarct. That develop in the brain and so this type of infarct most commonly affecting the lenticlostriate vessels of the basal ganglia so here i'm showing you an image that shows that the lenticlostriate arteries are coming off the middle cerebral artery and so if there is problem with the perfusion of these vessels it can cause lacunar stroke and this type of stroke again is more commonly seen with hypertension and then here on the left side is an example of an embolic stroke where you see that there is red area that is covering the areas of perfusion by the middle cerebral artery. So again, middle cerebral artery is most vulnerable to embolic strokes. And here you can see how there is red areas that is covering the area of perfusion of middle cerebral artery. And then the other two areas, the one on top, is from anterior cerebral artery and then the ones at the bottom are from posterior cerebral artery so let me erase these and so here you can see how neatly the uh, embolic stroke will show areas that are being supplied by the middle cerebral artery all right now here I have a question for you how long would it take for an ischemia to become irreversible in the neurons and the answer is an ischemia of more than five minutes is irreversible. And so these are the histological changes that will happen following infarction of the neurons. So in the first 12 to 24 hours, you will see red neurons. So an example of which is shown here. So here you can see the neuron and then the nucleus at the center. And it's uh, it has the red color. Now the reason that the neuron will become red color is that as the neurons die, it will start to lose some organelles that is normally being stained blue on the hemotoxin and eosin staining. So now that all these organelles are being destroyed and are no longer being stained blue, what is left is only the red staining. In the next one to three days, there would be necrosis and neutrophils that will accumulate at the site. Between three to five days, macrophages will be there. And then between one to two weeks, there would be reactive gliosis, where glial cells will start to respond to the damage. And then there is also vascular proliferation. And then finally, after two weeks, a glial scar will be formed. So here I have provided you with a memory aid to help you remember the order and the timing for the ch uh, histological changes that you will see with dead neurons. So the memory aid says dead brain RPM. So RPM is like uh, revolutions per minute. So just like your car, um, the engine, like how many RPM is that? So what is the RPM of a dead brain? So all you have to do here is assign odds number in increasing order to every one of these letters. So one, three, and five. So now we have red neurons up, up to day one, then we have PMNs or neutrophils up to day three, and then we have macrophages up to day five. So again, dead brain RPM, assign odd numbers, one, three, five. So red neurons for day one, PMNs or neutrophils until day three, and then macrophages until day five. And here, if I go back to the table, you can see the same thing. Red neurons up to day one, uh, PMNs from day one to day three, and then macrophages from day three to day five. Now, in terms of the management of stroke, the first things that you will have to do is to secure air, airway, breathing, and circulation, check vital signs, and obtain history if possible. Then you will ha have to obtain a non-contrast head CT. And the purpose of obtaining a non-contrast head CT is to determine whether it's a ischemic stroke or whether it's a hemorrhagic stroke. So if you use a contrast dye, it would interfere with the visualization of the blood. So it's important that you would use a non-contrast head CT. And then after that, you should consider the risk of aspiration as well as, as, well as elevated intracranial pressure. And both of these conditions could be helped with by elevating the head of the bed by 30 degree. And then depending on what type of stroke we are dealing with, if you are dealing with ischemic stroke, then you should start providing thrombolytics 
within a three to four and a half hour window since the start of the symptoms. Now, why do I say three to four and a half hours? Because it depends on the center that you're providing the care. If you're in a specialized centers, then you can provide thrombolytics up to four and a half hours since the start of the symptoms. And then um, if it's ischemic stroke, you should also provide aspirin to these patients. But then if the non-contrast head CT shows you that it's a hemorrhagic stroke, you should know that all of these are contraindications. So that's why you will first have to provide a non contrast head CT to find out what type of stroke are you dealing with. And if it's ischemic, then you can now proceed with the thrombolytics as well as aspirin. Now the next step would be to check for the blood pressure. So if you have not provided any thrombolytics to these patients, then the blood pressure goal should be less than 220 over 120 millimeter mercury. However, if you have provided thrombolytics, since thrombolytics will increase the risk of hemorrhage, then your blood pressure goal should be less than 185 over 110. Now, if the patient has TIA, then the uh, potential treatment options that you can have is that you could consider carotid endarterectomy. So if there is a carotid stenosis of 70 up to 99%, whether it's male or female, it's recommended for the patient to proceed with the carotid endarterectomy to remove the plaques inside the carotid artery. And then considering that males respond better to carotid endarterectomy, it's recommended that males who have life expectancy of more than five years and are asymptomatic, but their stenosis is more than 60%, so 60 to 99%, to still proceed with the carotid endarterectomy. And then you should provide aspirin for these patients if there is no contraindication, because um, uh, TIA is an indication that there is ischemic stroke to follow up. So you will have to start these patients on the aspirin to lower the risk of stroke. And then finally, risk factor management is recommended to both ischemic stroke as well as TIA patients. So as we just discussed earlier, we should start all these patients on antiplatelet medications like aspirin. We should control the blood pressure. We should, st we should consider starting patients patients on the lipid lowering medications like statins therapy and then finally it's recommended to start lifestyle modifications like for instance smoking cessation. And that concludes our discussion of the ischemic stroke as well as the transient ischemic attack.